wait. One more second of great effort with everyone in this football family. Is over. It is my pleasure to introduce. A new era begins on Rocky Top. We're going to do some very, very special things. So who is Butch Jones? And what are his plans for bringing a winning record back to the Vols? We're going to start from day one. From recruits to fans. We're hearing your thoughts on Tennessee's newest resident. It was a relatively safe hire. He's only going to do something great here at UT. And one of its highest paid. What we know about his deal with the university. And an hour-by-hour hour rundown of a very big day in Big Orange Country. Now on 10 News at 6. It's been 19 days since athletic director Dave Hart announced he fired Derek Dooley as Tennessee's head football coach. The calendar is going to fly by for Butch Jones between now and next September. And the reality hits pretty soon when that calendar gets going, too, because after a couple of uh, sort of warm-up games, if you will, Beth, he's got <laughs> games at Florida and at Oregon in early September. If, if you didn't know who he was, you certainly got to know his personality today by winning the press conference. Let's get him to be a great night. If Tennessee fans didn't know what to expect from their new head coach, this YouTube video explains it all. Locked in, whether you're in the game, whether you're in the sidelines. You understand? Yes, sir. You check out the pedigree of Butch Jones, coaching under Urban Meyer, also coaching under Brian Kelly. So he's been around guys who have won. Their respect for for him is, is pretty obvious in their comments. He's got a lot of energy. Looking forward to seeing what he can do. He was on my list. I was excited when I heard that uh, he was going to be our coach. I was really excited to hear we finally got one so we can uh, we can move forward. And according to USA Today's salary poll, it's a deal that puts him among the, top, the 20 highest paid coaches in football. It started with a frantic knock at the door. About 7 o'clock, uh, the occupants of 132 came down and informed me that the uh, their condo was on fire. So I called 911 immediately. Carol Cooper is the night security guard at English Mountain Condominium Resort. When she saw this fire, she started evacuating the six residents she knew were home in buildings one and two. I got them out uh, and their animals. Oh my God. There are 10 buildings in all. Ed Wagner lives in building three. It'll be 18 years in August. I've lived here full time permanent resident. At nine o'clock Tuesday morning, he was confident his building would remain standing. Hopefully my building will be uncompromised. But the wind picked up and the fire kept growing. Water became scarce. And just one hour later, Ed Wagner's condo was engulfed in flames. He watched 18 years vanish. For those of us that live here, it's everything we have. Uh, all of our belongings and memories are in these buildings. And so it, it's just tough to see something like this. Before fire consumed now four of 10 buildings, he made a mad dash for a few precious items. Snuck in and I got my great grandmother's antique rose lamp and my dog's ashes. And I came home just last night from St. Augustine, so I had a suitcase and my overnight bag. So you grabbed those? And I grabbed all that and I got my car. He, along with about a dozen residents, will now seek shelter with friends, family, and the Red Cross. As for Ed, he remains surprisingly calm through it all. One, he's thankful for insurance, and two, he's just plain optimistic. I've got a friend that lives in Building 6. Hopefully it's still there when this is all over with. In Sevier County, Allison Bybee, 10 News. It's been said that rescue dogs have a special sense of gratitude and loyalty, and you're about to see why. This is Juno. She was recently at a shelter in Bristol, Tennessee, just 24 hours away from being euthanized. When a husband and father of two in Alcoa, Tennessee, just happened to see her picture on the shelter's website. So I said, don't do this and hang on to her. I said, I'll be up there. Juno had been saved, but not just to be the family pet. No, this dog was saved for a very special reason. Lucas has a rare genetic disorder called uh, San Filippo syndrome or uh, MPS3 uh, type A. Most kids, as this disorder goes along, uh, usually by age seven, they go to usually just a vegetative state. So he's uh, getting ready to turn five here in just a couple of weeks. Despite what doctors said, the family thought Lucas could benefit from a service dog, but it was just too expensive. $15,000 they didn't have. 
That's when Chester took a leap of faith. For years I worked as a uh, in law enforcement and I uh, got to work with the with several of the canine handlers and stuff, helping with the, the training and stuff. You kind of look back over those skills I learned over the years and I said, you know, I said, I think I can do this on my own. From there, then I went through and I started training her for uh, her mobility uh, as far as helping Lucas walk. Uh. Juno is not only by Lucas's side wherever he goes, protecting him, guiding him, calming him, but she can also detect when something's about to happen. Sometimes he'll have seizures in his sleep and he won't wake up or anything, but she'll wake us up. Then one day, uh, Luke is sitting over here in his uh, corner and Gino was just going crazy around him. We couldn't figure out what's going on. She kept walking circles and whining and carrying on. And she'd go over and she'd nudge him with her uh, nose. And we went over and started checking Lucas and noticed that his oxygen levels had dropped dangerously low uh, just before he went into a seizure. And when a seizure does occur, or anything else that's a setback to Lucas's health, Juno is there. I would really be lost without her because she's, um, she's just like a, another guardian angel. A lesson for all of us, from a courageous little boy and a rescue dog. If I'm having a bad day or if I'm having a sad day, he always lightens it up. He's in constant pain, he's got cardiac issues. Uh, he is solely where his mind is deteriorating day by day. He's losing all of his skills, but nonetheless, every day he wakes up with a smile. He's constantly full of laughter and full of joy. He wants to live life, and he don't complain about what's going on. Wednesday, Hurricane Sandy no longer shielded the sun from the Smoky Mountains. And from Gatlinburg, the sunny view of snow-capped summits revealed a record-setting snowfall. I think just the amount of snow. This October was a record snowfall. We've had, at Mount Leconte, we measured 32 inches. Uh, that's a, a new October record. When crews finally cleared Newfound Gap Road, they opened the floodgates for a stream of sightseers. And that includes a surprised group from the Deep South. <laughs> We're from Louisiana and we don't get to see the snow. Tallahassee, Florida. We came up to see the changing of the leaves. And what a surprise this has been. Oh my gosh, it is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. At Newfound Gap, the strong winds sculpted trees with sideways slush and tourists carved paths through deep snow drifts. Now the park says they are happy to have folks come up here to Newfound Gap, enjoy these wonderful views, but be prepared, it's a lot colder up here, about 20 degrees colder, very strong winds, and when you're driving up, some of those curbs never see any sunshine. The slow melting snow piles can keep those shaded curves and tunnels wet and icy. And the park will close the road on short notice, meaning hikers who hit the snowy trails can be cut off from their cars. But Visitors Wednesday say the risk of slippery roads was worth the reward of crystal clear snapshots against a smoky mountain sky. This is just amazing, absolutely amazing. And what a treat for Halloween. <laughs> At Newfound Gap, Jim Matheny, 10 News. In 24 hours, the Boys and Girls Club unused land. Uh, it's really just unsafe, uh, unlevel. And it was just really rocky and we couldn't come over here and play. Made a transformation they had only dreamed about. <laughs> a little rain, cold and mud didn't stop dozens of Channel 10 employees and community volunteers from rolling out the field of dreams. Temperatures about 40 degrees colder than yesterday. <laughs> But hey, it's all for a good cause. I kind of like it, getting dirty and helping everybody um, do this. Today is hard working work. Channel 10 asked for your help to make it happen. And like always, East Tennesseans didn't disappoint. We received more than $25,000 in donations to pay for the sod, professional help, and equipment. We wouldn't be able to raise the money by ourselves to make the field. 11-year-old Rachel Lou Allen and many other Boys and Girls Club members came to put on the finishing touches. It was her story about the impact the club has made on her life that moved many of you to donate. And she wanted to thank everyone for their support, especially the Siler family, 
for their $20,000 donation. Dear Paul Siler, I would like to give you a personal thanks for the money you donated. I'm blessed for the DGC, and when I found out that you donated most of the money, it touched my heart. The Boys and Girls Club's goal is to teach lessons like the one Rachel has learned, the importance of giving back. In a time when the Scott County community is struggling, they're hoping to help this generation change the statistics. If we can help 100 kids graduate high school that otherwise wouldn't, that adds an economic impact to this community that, that is just tremendous. The field will be a resource not only for the club, but the entire community, giving Scott County's kids room to play and dream big. Right now, it looks like the field of dreams. Mary Scott, 10 News. They're designed to look hip and harmless, but the newest recreational drugs are anything but. It increases your blood pressure, it uh, tightens the chest, uh, makes it hard to breathe. They are sold online, even in some stores. The way it's labeled is a potpourri or an incense. The thing about these kids are either making it into tea or smoking it. Police and lawmakers are taking action, but dealers are finding ways to stay on the market. They change the formula all the time, and we're trying to stay out ahead of that. Tonight, we will hear from the experts and those with a personal story. I was terrified. And we'll explain how you can talk to your kids about these new drug threats in this 10 News Town Hall. That tornado killed two people and injured several others in the Rennie community in northern Cumberland County. And Beth Haynes, as you see there on your screen, has the latest from that community. I tell you what, last night it was hard to determine the severity of the damage. Today it is clear and it is devastating. We're about 10 miles from Crossville on Highway 27. Of course, that's just off Interstate 40. And we're told the path of destruction is at least three miles, seven homes completely destroyed, dozens others with some type of damage. Carolyn Jones did not survive the storm last night. She was at home with her husband, Harold. They both tried to make it to the basement. They just didn't get there in time. Harold is in the hospital. He had to get 12 stitches in his head, according to his daughter, Sheila Skaggs, who, as you mentioned, lives in Florida. She drove here overnight only to arrive and find her parents' home destroyed. The Jones home is simply a shell left more empty with the death of Carolyn Jones. She never deserved this. <laughs> Sheila Skaggs is devastated, wondering how her father, Harold, who was married to his first and only love for more than 50 years, will cope. I'm sure he thinks in some way he should have done something because he's always taken care of her. And on the night of the tornado, Harold tried to take care of Carolyn one last time. My dad had grabbed a flashlight off the kitchen bar and was headed down the basement steps, pulled the door behind him, and it just threw him to the bottom of the staircase. They were buried. He could hear my mom saying, I can't move, I'm stuck. And she said it probably about five times he said, and then he didn't hear her anymore. Just a few houses away, Shannon Bice took cover too. As soon as I walked in the bathroom, all I could do was just, I covered them up like this and the ceiling caved in. And it was just like that, it just happened. They said it lasted 30 seconds. She and four children made it out just barely. I don't know how they made it out of there. Not much else did. The children's rooms are destroyed. The roof is gone, the backyard a mess. But these photos and the people in them are safe. It's devastating, but we're all alive and I'm just very thankful. I'm just thankful we're okay. We want to go live to Jennifer Meckles, who is in Gulfport, Mississippi, and the wind has picked up even in the last 30 or 40 minutes, Jennifer. Good morning, guys. Yeah, it's picked up significantly since I last checked in an hour ago to the point where I'm having a hard time standing up. Uh, we are in Gulfport, Mississippi, right along the beach, where I believe what we're seeing is another band of rain, strong wind gusts, and possibly some storm surge. Now, one of the biggest concerns here in the eastern part of the path of the hurricane is that storm surge. The rising tides and the strong winds could cause the tide to come up and flood the area. We were out near the beach earlier and we were capturing just different pieces of video as far as the storm coming in. And uh, we believe we did see, yes, a possible tornado come through. We'll go ahead and show you the video. You've seen it a little bit already.
already, but here it is again. This is amateur video we were able to obtain of that movement forward, that wind gust, which we believe was a tornado. You can see it just knocks over that house. 10 News reporter Steve Butera, he grew up along the Jersey Shore, and Steve, you saw the storm's damage firsthand over the past few days. Walking into his home, now in ruins, my high school friend James Kiernan saw nothing but destruction around him. The township was here yesterday pretty much deeming the house not even livable. Even thousands of dollars in his beloved sports memorabilia damaged by the water, but it's the memories from photos to his diplomas that are impossible to replace. And he is just one of the many stories around Monmouth County showing how bad this storm really was. Kiernan gives us a tour of Union Beach right along the Jersey Shore, but it looks less like a town and more like a war zone. Given Megabus is expanding service in Tennessee, we set out to test the experience, travel time, and cost of a trip. I took the Megabus. I took a commercial plane, and Channel 10 photographer Tim Dale drove his news car to Atlanta. All right, there we are. Place your bets. Away we go. All right, Robin, see you in Atlanta. Okay, be safe travels. And then I'm in Atlanta in about four hours, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. It leaves here, stops in Chattanooga, then goes on to Atlanta. So now we're ready to go on three hours and eight minutes, according to the GPS. All right, nestled into seat 16A, a little after three o'clock, and we're just about to pull away from the gate, actually on time. And welcome to Atlanta traffic. It's 5 o'clock. I'm here at the CNN Center, which is across the road. Uh, it took me about a half tank of gas to get here, and that'll cost me to fill up. By my clock, it took a little less than four hours to take a flight, take MARTA, and then walk a few blocks. So I guess, Robin, I win. But look who's standing down the block. Yes, Tim Dale, our driver. Yeah, Elite Limos has us in their limousine. We are driving around, well, we're about to start driving around the streets of Knoxville, and we're heading out right about now, and we're going to head up to Channel 10, I believe, and uh, say hey to Todd, pick up John Martin, maybe say hello to some other folks. This is a Lincoln Navigator limo, so this thing's like as long as Neyland Stadium. Why don't you roll down the window, Beth, and let's say hello to these people. They're over here looking. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day! Hey! How are you? All right. The romant, most look at this. Happy Valentine's! Most romantic city in the country, right here. From country music's grandest stage. To a hometown benefit concert in East Tennessee. Well, we're the band Perry, and we're from right here in Greenville, and uh, we love, love, love small towns. The band Perry is one of the hottest country music acts in the world, with the industry's top honors from Grammy nomination to ACM, CMA, even Teen Choice Awards. And I feel like we have to almost make conscious efforts to uh, to soak in the moment, just, just cause because we're, so we're going so fast. Neil, Kimberly, and Reed Perry come here home to slow down. We can be out in, in a really the hustle and bustle of the music business and always come back home for peace of mind. But it's so great just to get back and reconnect with everybody and, and really for us find our creative center. Send me away with the words of a love song. In 2010, the band penned their breakout hit, now quadruple platinum song, If I Die Young, in Greenville. And we wrote If I Die Young sitting out on our front porch um, on the outskirts of town, and uh, we feel like there are a lot of songs that come from Greenville. These tight-knit siblings are songwriters and musicians. They've been together as a band for 14 years, but they were practically born with a mic and instrument in hand. Even though they have a trophy case full of accolades, their mom has her own way of measuring the band's success. If we ever had a show in Vegas. One. Um, if we ever got inducted into the Grand Ole Opry. Two. And three, if we had our own bobblehead. So we can three. mark one of those off the yeah. list tonight. And we're going to end it on a naughty note. This is called You Live. Ready? One, two, three. The band Perry. Greenville is, is home, home, sweet home. It and uh, is. we love the mountains. We love the people. Homegrown in Tennessee.